The soul is our mind, will and emotions and a very important part of our being. In this first message in this series, we discuss some of the common problems of the soul and what causes these problems. All right, we're going to rise up and uh, make our declaration this morning. So if you uh, brought your Bible, I ask you to hold your Bible in your hand. Let's rise to our feet. Uh, we're going to make our declaration and then we're going to uh, spend some time in God's Word. So let's all hold our Bibles high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn around to the people next to you, say hello to them, shake hands, greet them, smile, give them your name, take a few moments, and uh, then you may be seated, please. Starting today, um, on through, so through the month of July and through most of August, we're going to be doing a very important series, uh, which we are calling Emotional Wholeness and Deliverance. We're going to begin that this morning, uh, talking about emotional wholeness and deliverance. Uh, so this morning is more of an introduction towards the series, and then we will uh, you know, spend some time uh, introducing this subject this morning, and then we'll pick it up and build on it in the coming weeks. What the Bible reveals to us is that man, that is every human person, is a tripart being. So look at your neighbor and say, you got three parts. <laughs> so there are three parts to all of us. Spirit, soul, and body. You know, uh, in Genesis, the second chapter and the seventh verse, uh, we read that after God formed man out of the dust of the earth, so that's the physical part of him. God breathed into him and he became a living being. So there is a spiritual dimension to every human person, to the human person. God breathed. Something of the spirit was imparted to him. So man is not purely a physical being. There is a spiritual side to each of us. The body we see is a physical part. But there is the spirit and the soul. And the Bible has a lot to say about this. You can put the body through an x-ray machine or a CD scan, but you won't see the spirit and the soul show up. But yet there are the immaterial parts of us. The spiritual parts of us are very, very important. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, the verse many of us are familiar with. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here you see the three parts, spirit, soul, and body. And uh, God wants us to be whole, spirit, soul, and body. If you read the same verse from the Message Bible, it renders it this way. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Put you together. That means fix you. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. So God wants us to be fit. He wants us to be whole, spirit, soul, and body. Be whole in all of these three uh, parts or aspects of our being. Now, very quickly, the spirit is the eternal part of us. 
it's that part of us that enables us to connect with the unseen world, the spiritual realm. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions. It's the mind, the will, the emotions. It includes our thinking, our thoughts, and, uh, and, uh, and our memories, our imaginations, our thinking patterns. And it includes all of that. Now, in 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, John the Beloved is praying. He says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So this is a legitimate prayer. It's perfectly good and all right to pray that you, you and I would prosper in all things. Perfectly fine. John was a beloved disciple. He prayed. So I want you to prosper in all things. So it's perfectly leg legitimate for us to pray that way. And he said also pray that you'll be in health. That's also a leg legitimate prayer to pray. We want to be in good health. So he said, I pray that you may prosper in everything. Be in health. But notice how that is connected to the prosperity or the well-being of our soul. Just as your soul prospers. So there's a connection here. That my doing well in things of life. That my enjoying and being in health is connected to my soul prospering or being good or being well. So these are connected to each other and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So as we said, the soul is our mind, our will and our emotions. It's, uh, it includes our thought, our reason. Our imagination, our memories, our thinking patterns, all of this is, is part of the soul. But it's the unseen, it's the immaterial part of us. Now I want to just make mention of some biblical terminology. Uh, in the Bible, when you read about the inner person or the inner man, it's talking about both spirit and soul together. Right? So when you read about the inner man, your inner person... It's, it includes your spirit and soul, both together. Now, the other thing we must keep in mind is that in the New Testament, often when you, when you read about the heart of man, it's not referring to the physical organ, the heart. The heart of man, especially used in the New Testament, usually refers to the spirit of man, the spirit part. But when you read the Old Testament, again, the heart, you have to understand uh, is used more in the sense of the inner person rather than just your spirit. So especially as you go through the Old Testament, you read the heart of man. It's not just talking about your spirit, but it's talking about both your spirit and your soul together. It's an all-inclusive word. And you'll find this throughout the Old Testament. Heart, referring to both your spirit and soul. Your inner person, essentially. And uh, uh, one example is in Genesis, the um, sixth chapter, where the fifth verse where it says, you know, God saw the wickedness of man, it was great on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Notice, imagination thoughts, which we would normally associate with the mind, the word used is heart. So that heart is really talking about your inner person, and it includes your spirit and your soul. Just a little bit uh, understanding here so that when you read the Bible, you'll understand that there are times in the New Testament heart refers to exclusively your spirit, but most often heart includes spirit and soul, your inner person. Are you with me so far? Yep, not confusing you. Okay. Your inner person is the real you, who you are inside, this unseen part of you, your spirit and soul. That's your real you. You know, the outside physical body, we can change, you know, we can do all kinds of things with our body, and that's all right. But the real you is the who you are on the inside. You're in a person. Psalm 27 verse 19 says, as in water, face reflects face. That means you see your real you, your reflection. So a man's heart reveals the man. A man's inner person is the real you. That's who you really are. Get to know the inner person. Let me just make a mention here of the difference between the brain and the soul. The brain is the physical organ. 
But the soul is the immaterial part of you and me, right? So you can work on the brain, do neurosurgery, do this, do that, all that. That's your working on the physical organ. But the soul is the material part of us. And uh, it, it has the thoughts, the mind, and the mind, the will, the emotions. And what I think all of us understand is that the mind actually affects our brain and our body. Your mind actually affects your body. Okay? Uh, uh, you know, we talk about psychosomatic problems. That means the problem is actually something in the soul realm, but is manifesting or is affecting the body. So the mind does affect the body to a great extent. Now, just as we understand that there could be sicknesses of the body, there can be sicknesses of the soul. And just a small list here, this is not an exhaustive list, but just for you and me to understand and recognize some of the sicknesses of the soul, what we would generally refer to as emotional problems or psychological problems. Things like uncontrolled temper, anger, hatred, depression, controlling fears. Now, it's good to have healthy fear. You know, you know, you know you're not supposed to cross the road when there's traffic going. That's a healthy fear, you know. It's good. You need that. So you know, okay, let the traffic go, then I cross the road. But fears that control us, that really affect our whole lives and the way we go about living, those are controlling fears. And that means there's a problem in the soul. Uh, uh, worry, anxiety, poor self-esteem, uh, rejection, a deep sense of rejection. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Uh, feelings of inadequacy. I can't do this. I'm, I can never achieve anything. Sense of failure. Feelings of insecurity. Suicidal tendencies. Lust, addictions, and so on. These are problems, and many more. These are all problems of the soul. Are you with me so far? Yeah. These are issues. And, and you know, we've got to address them. God wants us to be whole. Fit even in our soul, in this area of our lives. And so we want to identify the problems. We want to know what causes them. And then we want to see what is God's remedy. How does God bring an answer, a solution to these things? You know, so when we have problems in the soul, it, like we said earlier, it affects other areas of our life. And so let's just mention a few life problems that are related to problems in the soul. So let's say I'm struggling with something in my soul. How does it impact my everyday life? What are some of the life problems that we could talk about? First, there are, there are behavior and choices. Our behavior and choices are affected. Uh, there are people who may be having compulsive, addictive, sometimes impulsive, repetitive uh, behavior issues. You know, it's okay one time you eat too much biryani, that's okay. But, you know, if that is controlling your life, that's a problem. And sometimes the problem could be in the soul. You know, uh, every time you're under stress, you head for a big bar of chocolates. <laughs> and you keep on eating chocolate. I mean, you eat a little chocolate, that's okay. But if you go there and it just becomes that you're Bars of chocolate become your way to relieve stress. There's a problem here. So there's a behavior problem expressing this compulsive, addictive, repetitive, uh, impulsive behavior. But the problem is really in the soul. And you're not dealing with that. But it manifests in this kind of behavior. Another area would be, of course, the emotional well-being. Our emotional well-being is affected. Um, you know... We live under fear or constant anxiety. Some of, you know, may go through serious bouts of depression. Uh, some could be living with a constant state of hopelessness or rejection. So our emotional life is affected and it's not really at its best. We feel victimized, uh, we have low self-esteem, so on and so forth. 
Another area that gets affected because of problems in the soul are relational problems. I mean, we just can't get along with people. And it can manifest in so many ways. Withdrawal. We don't want to be around people. Mm, stay away from me. I don't want to talk to anybody. Now, we withdraw from healthy relationships. Or there could be anger. We're just angry with everybody. Now, just a little wrong thing they say can tick us off. And boom, there's an explosion. <laughs> or, you know, we become dominating, controlling, sometimes manipulative. Sometimes we could even become violent and hurtful to other people. And, and now all of this, this, this relational problems, relationships often stem from problems in the soul. Our life experiences, things that we actually experience in life. Uh, failure, recurring failure, debt, uh, unfaithfulness in marriage, divorce. These experiences in life many times have their root in an emotional issue. So a person is not able to keep a proper job. And, uh, uh, you know, he's, he keeps losing a job over and over again. And then you wonder, like, I mean, are the bosses wrong? Are his co-workers wrong? No, no. It's probably a problem in the soul. They're just not able to, you know, handle responsibility or be accountable or you know, be regular at work and so on. So it's an emotional problem. It's showing up in their life circumstance, in their life experience. Or, you know, being in constant debt. And you think maybe they need to earn more money. No, the problem may not be they want, need to earn more money. Uh, the problem is the salary comes in on, on the first of the month. By fifth, they've gone through all three malls around town and just gone. Money's gone. And so, and why do they do that? They just are getting some emotional high by spending that money. And so they're always in debt. So it's not that they need to earn more money. They've got to deal with this issue, this emotional issue that's causing them to uh, handle the, or mismanage or mishandle their finances and put them in a place of debt. So like this, there are many life experiences that real issue is a problem in the soul. And of course, we know our physical health can also be affected when our things are not going well in the soul. Uh, uh, doctors can tell us that. And the Bible also is very clear in just a couple of verses. Uh, Proverbs 15, verse 30, it says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. I mean, you're good, cheerful, because your inside is good, healthy, and merry. Uh, Proverbs 17, verse 22, A merry heart does good like medicine. You're good on the inside, it does good to your body. A merry heart is like medicine, really blesses your body, uh, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. It, it really affects your health. So these are some of the problems. Now, what are the causes of these problems in the soul? How do problems in the soul occur? How does it happen to us? Uh, let's identify some of these. The first one that I would really put out there is wrong thinking or you want to say wrong mindsets wrong believing this affects the condition of our soul when we think wrong a wrong thought that has gripped us just a wrong thought so take for example and I'm just making up these examples but of course, they're, you'll find them in real life. Let's say somebody is suicidal. They want to end their life. They don't want to live anymore. What's the problem in the soul? There's a state of hopelessness. They feel like life is not worth living. But why do they feel like that? Why is that problem in the soul? Possibly uh, wrong thoughts. The thought is, I will never amount to anything. I can never achieve anything in life. So it's a wrong thought. They think I can never amount to anything in life. A wrong thought has now filled them with a sense of hopelessness and has now led them into a place of life is not worth living. Let me end it. So you got to deal with that wrong thoughts. Are you with me? Wrong thought, wrong thinking, wrong believing can affect the state of our soul 
And like this, you can have many examples. Just wrong thinking. Now, the enemy, the devil, is very good at getting believers to accept wrong thoughts. I mean, that's his main strategy. The Bible calls him his first name. His name is Deceiver or the father of lies. So that's what one of his main strategies. Let me plant some lie, maybe a lie, one single lie. Put that thought in the mind of a believer and the believer accepts it, embraces a lie. The devil is also an intimidator. He goes about like a roaring, intimidates. The devil is also called the accuser of the brethren. So constant accusation. You, you did that 25 years ago. <laughs> accuse, accuse, accuse. You're not good. Oh, look at what your life is like. Oh, accuser of the brethren. So he uses these wrong uh, deceptive thoughts, deceptions, accusations, intimidations. Uses these kinds of things against the believer. Wrong thoughts. And if we are not careful and we accept that wrong thought and make it part of our thinking, then our believing also goes wrong. We believe wrong things about ourselves, about God, and so on. And then it affects the state of our soul. For instance, there could be somebody who has a deep, you know, their behavior is they've withdrawn from everybody, don't want to talk to anybody. What is the problem? Problem is rejection, a deep sense of rejection. I feel rejected. Nobody really likes me. What's the thought? Ah, oh, Father God doesn't love you. Father God doesn't love you. Why? You didn't read your Bible for one whole week. <laughs> I mean, it could, I'm just making it up. But a wrong thought. Father God doesn't love you. Because you did something bad. So you feel, if God rejects me, Hey, surely people are going to reject me. So the sense of rejection and then the resulting behavior is withdrawing from people. What's the root? A wrong thought. God doesn't love me because I committed some serious sin or whatever. So the devil brings that into the minds of people. So we need to guard our minds against wrong thinking. You know, these lies, these accusations, these intimidations we believe, they will actually cripple us. They cripple us. We can't do things. Just wrong thought. A second uh, cause for these emotional problems are wrong speaking or wrong words. See, words are powerful. God has put that throughout the Bible. And that's why, you know, almost every Sunday we keep reminding you, speak right words, make the declaration, say it. Words are so powerful. Words that you speak about yourself over your own life. And words that people speak to you, which you agree with, which you accept. Those words are very powerful. And these words... When you speak them or others speak to you and you accept them, now begin to become part of your mindset, your thinking, your thinking pattern. And they begin to affect your soul. And so we need to be careful about the words we speak and the words others speak over us, which we, we accept. Reject those wrong words. Guard your mind. And there are many scriptures in the Bible that tell us about the power of words. I'll just mention Psalm, Psalm 64 verse 3. Uh, people, for some, some people, they sharpen their tongue like a sword and they shoot their words, their bitter words like arrows. So words, they speak and they penetrate our soul. They affect our soul. We begin to believe those words. Uh, positive things, Proverbs 8, 12, verse 18. There is a one who speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. So you can actually promote health by speaking the right words. You can help others be whole, bring wholeness into people's lives by speaking the right words. Or Proverbs 16, 24, pleasant words are like honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. They bless the soul and the body speaking right words. It's so important. Speak right words about your own self. Speak right words uh, over your family members, your children, and so on. Because these words, 
they can bless the soul and the body. So, you know, we and I must counteract those negative words. A third reason or a cause for emotional problems are is continual deep-seated sin. You know, suppose I do something wrong, you know, kick the dog, chase the cat, something like that, you know. I say, God, I'm sorry. So, but uh, continual sin damages your soul. And we don't understand that. There are many places in scripture. I'll make mention of a few. In 1 Peter 2 verse 11. Peter says. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. Abstain from fleshly lusts. Which war against the. Fleshly lusts. The things that I give in to just to satisfy my uh, cravings of the flesh. He says those things war against your soul. They're going to trouble your soul. They're going to affect your mind, emotions, your will. So be careful. Stay away from those things. So continual deep-seated sin is actually affecting the soul. Your, uh, your mind, your will, your emotion, that, that part of you. And not only that, but Continual deep-seated sin actually opens the door to demonic influences in our lives. Now this is serious. Because many believers think, you know, I'm saved, finished, the devil can't touch me. Hey, but if you sin, you're saying, devil, please come in. Paul writes to believers in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. He says, be angry, but don't sin. So we all get angry. Be angry, but do not sin. And diffuse your anger before the sun goes down. Get rid of it. So we all get angry. But don't let your anger cause you to do what's wrong. And also get rid of it before the end of the day. Get rid of it. Release it to God. Let God heal you. Release it. Don't carry it on to the next day. And then the next verse in Ephesians 4.27, he's telling the believer, don't give place to the... So believer, you be on guard. You don't give the devil any entrance in your life. So continual deep-seated sin not only damages my soul, but it also becomes an entry point for demonic influences in my soul. The devil gains access. He's got a foothold there. And so we got to be careful about sin, continual sin. Number four, we're just identifying what causes problems. You all with me so far? The fourth one is trauma and adverse experiences. You know, we all go through difficult situations in life. None of us are exempt from the challenges of life. Uh, there are problems. We all face them. Things, unexpected things happen. But when we face those difficult situations, we need to make sure, and we experience hurt and pain, and we need to make sure we go quickly to the Lord and learn to receive healing from God. He is the healer of our soul, and He's the restorer of our soul. We should do that. But if we don't do that, we can continue carrying this hurt and this pain inside of us if we don't receive healing from God. And this hurt and this pain actually becomes sin in our lives. And sin opens the door. So what do you mean? Take for example, you know, I'm just making an example. Suppose there's strife at home. My mom and dad are always fighting. Uh, there's always constant strife. It not only affects both of them, but the children growing up are also affected. What could be some of the outcomes? I'll just mention one. I'm not saying there's the only one. There could be many outcomes, but one. Say the child gets very angry towards you know, the parent, one of them, or both of them. Anger builds up. Why are they being like this? Why are they doing? So there is anger inside of the child being built up over time because of the constant strife. 
Now, mom and dad may pour, lavish the child with everything. You know, the latest gadgets, all of that. And they're wondering, why is the kid so angry? It's not about the gadgets. It's about the strife that is affecting the soul of the child. And this is slowly being built up. And what does anger usually lead to? Anger leads to hatred. Hatred leads to murder. Now, murder doesn't have to mean like somebody sticking a knife in the throat. It could just mean violent reactions towards the parents. Now, if this is not addressed, the child takes this to some big multinational company. <laughs> he's got his master's degree, he's got his PhD, whatever. He's got a job, but his soul is carrying hurt and anger. And when he sees his boss, he's reminded of his dad <laughs> or mom, whoever, you know. And so now, that, that anger and that, that thing begins to come out towards the boss. And the boss is wondering like, man, this guy's highly qualified. He's got the right skill. But somehow, he, you know, every other day, there's an outburst. What's happening? Okay. There's a problem in the soul. And then he comes to APC. He's <laughs> a great guy. Very talented, very skilled. But when he sees the pastor, he thinks of his dad. <laughs> I'm just making up. But these are real things that happen. So wherever there is authority, he connects it back to his experience with his parents. That was his first experience of authority, mom and dad. And that was terrible. Therefore, every other experience of authority is always connected back to that. And there is anger. There is hatred and there could be violent outbursts. The poor boss, pastor, <laughs> don't know what is going on <laughs> until they do a series on emotional homeless. <laughs> I'm just joking here. But you understand how a, a situation in life, an adverse experience just going through life, because it was not dealt with and addressed there at that time uh, through love and forgiveness and healing, uh, coming in at that point. So we all get hurt. I'm not saying, you know, life is for anyone is going to be perfect. Never. There's, there are difficult situations, but we need to learn how to receive healing and let go and, and be released. Of it. And if we don't, it's going to build up. It's going to get worse. And when we carry these negative things, it is sin for me to have anger. Sin opens the door and there will be unclean spirit. The evil spirits will come and empower these things in the life of that person. Now he may get saved along the way. Baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. And if he still doesn't deal with that, it will still continue to be a problem in his life. Until that is addressed. So, trauma. Adverse situations in life. Now... As I'm going to go to the next couple of points here, I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to be mentioning evil spirits quite a bit. So tell your neighbor, don't get scared. <laughs> now, I'm going to talk about this because this is a fact, right? And we should not be afraid of facts, especially as we seek to identify uh, the causes of these emotional problems and uh, we need to address them. So, you know, we are not afraid of demons. We are not afraid of what the devil does. We just want to recognize that, not to inflate, uh, you know, not to make him look great, but just to realize there are, this is a valid, gen, genuine cause of problems in people's lives, even the lives of believers, and they need to be addressed. So as I'm talking about these things, I don't want you to get scared or worried or anything. It's, you know, it's, it's fact and we need to deal with it. So the fifth thing is this, that Involvement in occult and false religions opens up door to emotional problems. Now, you know, uh, occult is basically us trying to connect to the dark side of the spirit world. We as believers must connect to the Holy Spirit, open our lives to the work of the Holy Spirit so, uh, and, and move in the things of God. But unfortunately, sometimes even Christians, even believers end up doing things that are actually occultic in nature. They're actually trying to connect to the dark side, to unclean spirits, to evil spirits, to demons. And uh, these actually give a valid right of entry 
to evil spirits to work in the life of a believer. God is very clear, both in the Old and the New Testaments, that these occult practices is not allowed. Don't go near it. Don't do it. And I'll just read some of these verses, just two passages here. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25 and 26, he says, You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not cover the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God, nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it, utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. So God is saying, don't bring those idols and those, those images and the things that these, these people do, which they use it in forms of worship. Now, you don't bring a nice souvenir. I went to play in souvenir. Bring a nice, put it in your showcase. You know. Don't do those things. Now, how many Christians, believers, we make nice trips to all sorts of places and then we bring those accursed things and let it be in the house. It looks nice here. Oh, there's a vacant spot. I need to fill it and bring something, put it there. But outside is actually being used for worship and used for whatever. But now you and I bring it in. We need to decorate the house. There are lots of other things you can decorate your house with. But we do it. And God has said in his word, look, when you bring that thing, you're bringing an abomination into your house and you are going to how what it brings. It's going to affect you. Because you brought it in. Now, I know some of us may be living in homes where somebody else has it. Well, you didn't do it. You're not bringing it in. You're protected. So you don't have to be afraid. You're not be scared. But if you are the one bringing it in, then you're responsible. So I know you're going to go home and check. <laughs> Oh, look at Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, verses 9 to 15. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, modern day we call him fortune teller, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. The Lord your God raised up for you a prophet like me, that she's referring to Jesus Christ, from your maids, from your brethren, him shall you. Yeah. So he's saying, don't get involved in any of these occult practices, whether it's fortune telling, anybody who's a medium, a spiritist, any form. And today, you know, you can have all kinds of games that people play, call up spirits and do this and that. No, anything with it, don't get involved. But how many believers read horoscopes? You might have a horoscope app on your phone. <laughs> I want to know, what is this week going to look like? <laughs> Where are my stars? <laughs> how many believers do that? Then they go sit in front of somebody, please read my future. Look at your hand, he'll open the cage, parrot comes out, picks a card. <laughs> he reads the card, he tell you this and this. Okay, okay. I mean, believers doing all these things. These are mediums. People who are trying to connect to the spirit world, trying to tell you about your past, your present, your future. And God says, no. You listen to Jesus Christ. And so, you know, when we do these things, we are giving legal access. We are giving the right to evil spirits to come into our lives. Because you're involved in them, in those activities, in those kinds of things. God's clearly warned us. And even the New Testament. And I'm not reading all those verses there. So, you know, demons 
evil spirits begin to gain access. Now, why should we um, talk about it? I'll come to that a little later. Let me mention one more. Number six, there are ancestral commitments and practices, meaning things which our forefathers would have done, which were actually rituals, prayers, consecrations, uh, dedications that they may have done to wrong gods and goddesses. I mean, even Christians go to Ane Velankani. Oh. I mean, like, that's not Jesus. But it's close to, it's not Jesus. <laughs> it is not Jesus. But it's very close. Not Jesus. <laughs> Right? So they go to all these burnt candles, put pictures in the house, all kinds of things. I mean, I'm talking Christians, believers do all these things. And they make prayers, I don't know what they pray, you know, all kinds of prayers. Now, of course, when you pray, your prayer, your dedication, your consecration is an open invitation you are making to the devil to come in and do his work in your life. And he may bless you a little bit to make you feel happy and give him more room. So you go and make a few more prayers. But at some point, you show his real self. What he's come to do. He comes only to steal, kill and destroy. He might sugarcoat it a while. But sooner or later, you're going to face the consequences. So they pray. Bless me, my children, my grandchildren. So they've not only blessed, given access to themselves. They've also now said, continue on down my they have given legal access. So, things people may have done, which you and I are not aware of, have actually given legal access to the enemy in our lives. Now, as a believer, as a born-again believer, saved by the blood of Jesus, your spirit is secure. You have been delivered. Uh, you have been translated out of darkness into the light. But your soul and your body needs work. Our soul, our mind needs to be renewed with the word of God. We need to experience transformation there. Our body needs to be sanctified and, and, and crucified and cleaned up. So, when our forefathers made pledges and invitations to these false gods and goddesses, they continue affecting the soul and the body of the believer, even though Jesus Christ has totally redeemed your spirit. And part of the problems in the soul are therefore connected back to what was done in the past. So what you and I need to do is to say, I don't care who prayed which prayer. I am canceling those prayers in my life. They prayed those prayers. I'm not responsible. But I'm canceling those. From me and on, those prayers will have no effects. Are you with me? We stand up, we do that, and we say, that's this. We say, no. They may have done all those things in ignorance, I know. You know, uh, sometimes even Christians, they call these soothsayers at home, bring the parrot, bring the cage, call the children, look, 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 parrot, parrot, no, that's sit down, do all the palm reading, this, that. It's very fanciful, but actually, you are in, um, inviting, you are entertaining evil spirits because those people are mediums. But you said, but they told me everything right. Of course, the devil was around before you were born. <laughs> so he knows. So they told you things that are right. That doesn't mean they are right. They are from the dark side. And so we need to deal with it. Now let's just make, mention a few things about evil spirits. and just, just to recognize the problem. I don't want us to be scared. I don't want you to feel bad. I mean, look, look you've got to, we've got to deal with the root of the issues. You know, otherwise, what we'll do is every six months, we'll have to trim the outside. Come, come, come. Six months back, same problem. Trim, trim, trim. Six months again, same problem. Keep trimming, trimming, trimming. Why don't we just cut the roots? Why don't we just deal with the roots? And if the root is being empowered by evil spirits, deal with it. Let's deal with it. Let's get rid of it. So in scripture, we find the work of demons. I'm not doing a complete study here. But I do want to mention that, that these evil spirits actually empower and actually work through certain things. For example, they connect with negative emotions that they promote. So there is spirit of anger, spirit of hate. Spirit of lust, 
spirit of pride, spirit of jealousy, spirit of self-pity, a spirit of depression or heaviness. You find these, many of these things. So the negative emotion is empowered by a corresponding spirit and you call it by its name. Or the evil deeds that they empower. Spirit of lying, spirit of murder, spirit of drunkenness, spirit of adultery, spirit of uncleanness, spirit of sorcery, spirit of witchcraft, spirit of suicide. That they're evil deeds but empowered by the, a corresponding evil spirit. Or physical conditions. Spirit of infirmity, spirit of pain, spirit of arthritis, spirit of a back problem, spirit of death. Corresponding. Causing a physical problem. Or... Situations they orchestrate, life experiences, spirit of confusion, spirit of poverty, spirit of lack, and so on. So we identify that evil spirit by the condition that they are empowering. Now, I want us to understand something that, and also many of these operate as groups, so they do teamwork. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 12. He said, you know, one spirit cast out. He goes and gets seven others worse than him. So they have degrees of wickedness. So you guys are worse than me. Come, let's go. <laughs> and they work together. So you'll find some of these connected groups of demons like resentment, hatred, anger, murder, working together. Or Self-pity, despair, depression, suicide, working together. Or lust, uncleanness, adultery, fornication, working together. So let's say a person was engaging in pornography. Maybe the first time, two times, he was just like casual. He says, okay, I have nothing to do. And he goes, in. as he continues, he opens his life to a spirit of uncleanness. So now his behavior is empowered, he's now controlling that life by a spirit of uncleanness. And if he's not careful, that will get in a spirit of fornication. Now he begins to commit sexual acts that are wrong. He's controlled by those spirits in his area, in his life. And so, in bringing freedom to this person in the soul realm to get them out, not only must they discontinue that wrong thing of pornography, but you also got to set him free from the spirit of uncleanness and fornication that have come into his soul and have controlling him there. So it's wholeness and deliverance that's needed for him. Or a person who is about to commit suicide, who's suicidal, He's got a deep sense of hopelessness in his soul. It's just gripped with hopelessness. But the reason was a thought that came into his mind that your life will not amount to anything. So not only do we have to deal with the thought, help him to believe the truth that God has good plans for his life, but we also got to get rid of the spirit of hopelessness and the spirit of suicide that have gained access into his soul because of wrong thinking and wrong uh, believing and have are now empowering hopelessness and suicide in his life. So there is both bringing wholeness and bringing deliverance into his life that's needed. Are you with me so far? So we need to do both. Now, I just want to quickly mention there's a difference between possession and oppression. A believer can never be possessed because in your spirit, the Holy Spirit resides. Christ lives in you. Possession means take full control. Evil spirits can't take full control of you. You're a believer. But oppression, oppression means wrongful entrance uh, and uh, wrongful enforcing of their power over your life. They occupy a territory trespassing in your soul, in your body. That's possible for a believer. So when you're ministering deliverance, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to cast out and send them out. So whether it's a person who is fully possessed, it's, it's not very common, you'll find some people, but they'll usually be in the graveyards or some other places, fully possessed. You don't find them sitting in church and listening to sermons. <laughs> so 
But that, whether you're dealing with somebody who's fully possessed, whether you're dealing, bring deliverance, you're casting out, you're doing the same thing, you are casting out. You're saying, I command this spirit to leave. So the terminology is the same, but the degree of influence is very different. So please don't get scared and say, oh, I'm possessed. No, that's, that's not it. You and I are being affected. You're troubled by these spirits, and so we need to deal with it. We need to get rid of it. So why talk about all this in church on Sunday morning and have the risk of people getting scared? Because Satan and his demons, they prefer darkness. They don't want to be exposed. They don't like it when we stand up here and tell you the facts. They like to hide. They don't like to be uncovered. You know, so it's okay if I preach a nice sermon, make you feel happy, and just pat you on the back and send you out. They'll quietly be doing their work. But listen, we've got to bring wholeness to the soul. And that means we need to deal with the root. We've got to get down to the root. What is the problem? And sometimes it could be the work of demon spirits. And the worst thing they hate is for believers to know the authority in Christ. And to walk in that authority. For you to know and say, yeah, I can walk in it. I have authority. Jesus gave me the authority to cast out spirits and expel evil spirits. I tell evil spirits to leave my soul, my body, if they are there, to leave. So they, they don't like believers knowing their authority. I want to close with this. Some pitfalls to avoid. We must avoid, you know, don't think that every physical, emotional problem is because of evil. So don't go to that extreme. We've got to take responsibility for our own actions, right? What I am stating this morning is that it is possible that in some cases, the root of the problem is not just wrong thinking or it's not just wrong words that have been spoken in our lives, but sometimes the root of the problem goes deeper and that there is demon spirits that are actually affecting the life of the believer. And in such cases, you need to address that. Others will be overlooking the actual root or actual cause of the problem. But let's not get in, let's not make the mistake of saying everything. You know, like if you, if you go out to the, to the field and your car doesn't start, don't say, devil is troubling me. Maybe there's no gas in the car. <laughs> so, you know, don't get ridiculous. Right? Don't think every problem is the devil. No. But you've got to be aware. That the enemy can cause certain problems and you need to understand, you need to discern where things are. So when something is controlling, when something is oppressive, you know, you feel that you're, it's something bigger than you, controlling, oppressive. When something is recurring over and over. When something is unidentifiable, like you can't, you, you can't, like, I don't know why it's happening. When, when these are symptoms, then you say, okay, it's very likely it's an evil spirit that's causing this. So first you look, you know, what is the cause? What, is, what could be cause? I mean, have people spoken wrong things over me? Have I been speaking wrong things? Have I been in deep-seated sin? So I, let, I first cleared those things. But if those are not the real causes, then I will say, okay, let's deal with something more um, here. So... We don't want to give too much attention to the devil, but we do want to recognize that that has to be dealt with in bringing wholeness to the soul. We have to also minister deliverance. So what I do constantly is I keep guard for my life. So not only do I want to live holy, but if I feel like I, I may have given any access to evil spirit, I say in Jesus' name, I reject any access I've given to any spirit. If I can identify it by a name behind what it is, I say, I expel There's nothing wrong. I'm just keeping myself clean. That's all. So don't feel like, oh, pastor, you, you think you're going, to, you're going to cast out devils out of me? I mean, I, I've been a believer for 50 years, pastor. You know? Listen, you, if you have a garden, you want to keep the garden clean. If a stray dog comes in, you've got to chase it off. You don't, there's nothing wrong. You, you're protecting your garden. So in the same way, we stand up against these things because we know they empower behavior, they affect emotions, and we want to guard ourselves. Amen? So next Sunday, 
when we continue this, we're going to really pray for how you and me to receive healing and deliverance. So we're going to go through that together here in, in, in this uh, in the service. And we're going to pray and I'm going to lead you through. I'm going to explain to you how we're going to do it. And I'm going to lead you through a time of just, you know, us praying together and, and receiving healing and deliverance right here on Sunday morning. But through the course of this week, I want you to take, think about these things. Are there problems in your soul? Are there some things you're struggling with? Now, if you're fine, praise God, keep, keep going that way. But if there are problems, face up to it. Second, what could be the causes of these problems? I mean, we went through a list, but you think about it. I mean, did I, am I thinking wrong? Am I believing something that's not truth? It doesn't match up with the word of God? But let's, let's put your finger on it and accept it. Yeah, I'm actually thinking wrong. I should be thinking like this. I should be thinking according to what the Bible says. Or have I believed some words that somebody has spoken over me? It could be parents. It could be a boss. It could be a colleague. It could be a friend. Somebody, they said something and you just embraced it. You believed it. And so now that's stuck in your thinking. It's become a part of your mindset. I mean, you identify, or is there sin in my life? Am I, you know, accommodating something that I should not be accommodating? Or it could it be other things? Was I ever involved in the occult? Uh, at any point? Did I did even things, do things playfully, you know? Or could it be things that, you know, my ancestors have done and, and I need to deal with that? So you just examine your life, prepare your life. You pray about these things so that when we come next Sunday morning, you come prepared to receive healing and deliverance. Is that okay? Amen? And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing to be wrong to sh ashamed of. We just want God to make us whole. We want God to work in our lives. And we stand up and identify these things and let God do his work. So let's rise to our feet. Thank you for your patience this morning. And I've gone well over time. Um, let's take a few moments here, please, this morning as we wait before God. Father, we just thank you for your word and things you've spoken to us in your word very clearly, God. I pray this morning that you'll give us the grace to face up to the truth. Help us to be willing to embrace your truth. Holy Spirit, I pray that if we've done wrong things, that we will take responsibility for it, God. And we will seek your help. To break free, to let go, to turn away, to repent, and to turn towards you, God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will do your work of just bringing healing and complete deliverance to each of our lives. We don't have to wait till next Sunday, God. You can do it right now, right here. You can just move by your presence and set things free in our lives. So I pray you'll begin to move even now, Lord. That there'll be this willingness for our, in our hearts and our minds to change and receive your work in our lives. So we welcome you, God. We welcome you. We welcome your presence. May every person here, God, be touched by your presence, by your power, God. Let things in our lives be touched. Our mind, our will, our emotions, let it be touched by your presence. Let there be, Lord, a sense of release, a breaking free from wrong thoughts, wrong thinking, wrong words, things that we may have accepted as okay. Help us.
Father, we just pray that in each of our lives, we will experience, God, complete release, wholeness, freedom, deliverance, by the power of your Holy Spirit in each of our lives. And we thank you, Father, that you are our healer. Thank you. You are our deliverer. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just close, please. The grace, the abundant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the sweet comforting, strengthening, empowering presence of His Holy Spirit be with all of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.